Okay, we are live. So this week, Larry Ray's trial started. It's a federal trial. He is being accused of starting running a criminal enterprise that engaged in sex trafficking, forced labor, money laundering, and extortion. And I was at this trial. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little um, feedback there from my phone. Sorry about that. Um, so I was at this trial starting with the picking the jury. And the judge for this trial is Lewis Lyman, who is coincidentally Doug Lyman, the director of the movie Swingers Brother. And he's a really gentle, mellow judge. I really liked him. And during jury selection, he was really stressing the importance of the jurors, potential jurors, telling the truth. And I had to think that this was a reaction to the Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell, Juror 50 scandal, which is still being litigated where a juror is was given immunity who lied on a juror application why he lied he said he was rushing the defense is saying that he's an activist juror how that's going to end is anyone's guess so it was interesting to see that really play a part in this trial and what <clears throat> The whole origins of this criminal enterprise start at Sarah Lawrence College, which is my alma mater, where this father, Larry Ray, moved into college housing with his daughter, Talia. So to understand what Slonim 9, where the place where they lived on campus, it's it would be like living in a condominium. So you'd get maybe seven or eight, nine of your friends together, and you'd all share a house. So all these houses are together on campus. So you all share a kitchen, and it's really like a real house, but everybody has their own bedroom. So Lawrence Ray <laughs> gets out of prison. He's in prison for not complying with the judge's orders to hand over custody of his children to his ex-wife. So he goes to prison, he gets out of prison, and he just moves in to this college campus where his daughter's a sophomore in college. She's got a boyfriend living with her and all her friends. And he becomes like a Svengali to these kids. And he starts counseling them on their problems and their psychological issues. And what happens is it, it starts out as a really positive thing, but it goes into forced, he was forcing his women devotees into prostitution, <sighs> um, forced labor where he brought them all to North Carolina to work on this house, doing heavy, heavy labor. He would threaten them, verbally abuse them. And we heard a lot and he, and he also, starved the women every it's, it was this guy's like keith ranieri of nexium spiritual brother everything but the branding and the kind of dos cult uh was in this trial it's so unbelievable that new york is seeing all these cases that are so similar from r kelly to nexium to maxwell it, it, this was just a really shocking, so shocking trial to attend. And as a Sarah Lawrence student, I just sat there getting more and more enraged that the college didn't put an end to this. He lived on the college campus for months. And there's just no way that the administration didn't know it's a very small campus. That never changes. And if they didn't know, they're incompetent. And if they did know and they ignored it, they're negligent. So I don't see. And they're just ignoring it. So I, it's really enraging to watch this trial as an alumnus. And the first wit. So 
let's get into the opening statements. For the government, Lindsey Keenan gave a, gave a fantastic opening statement. Again, again, sorry. Again, she's using the words criminal enterprise because the words cult have no meaning at all legally. So she said he ran a criminal enterprise and that he was ruthless. What he would do was he would start, uh, he would accuse one of these kids, and I call them kids, they're like 19, 20 years old, of breaking something with, or, or wrinkling his clothes, scratching a dish. And he would make a list of things and say, you have to pay me back. And he would interrogate them for hours on video, on tape. When the FBI raided the place, they found tons and tons of cell phones, audio tapes, videotapes, a lock on the refrigerator so he could starve his <laughs> women devotees. And he would interrogate them for hours. And this interrogation became so terrible that these people would confess and offer up hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay these, these transgressions. He also was slightly paranoid and accused, not slightly, very paranoid, and accused these, his devotees of poisoning him. So, which is interesting because New York Magazine investigated the story thinking that they were going to investigate a story about poisoning. And he also had something to do with prosecuting Bernard Carrick, the police commissioner, and that the police commissioner, along with these kids, were poisoning him. And what they found was quite different, which was the, this cult. <laughs> and that's what led to his prosecution. So not bright, but not too bright to call in uh, the investigator you call in a journalist, one of them who was one of these journalists, Ezra, was a Sarah Lawrence grad, is my understanding. So we heard from the defense, and I thought, what is their defense going to be for this? We heard about him taking, stalking a devotee who left, who didn't want to prostitute anymore, and dragging her to a hotel room tying her up, suffocating her over and over again for hours until she agreed to go back to prostitution. He amassed millions in prostitution money from this criminal enterprise, also up for tax evasion, So where he put all this money in different accounts. You also saw pictures of their living quarters. So they eventually moved off of Sarah Lawrence campus into a Upper East Side apartment. And you're looking at these pictures of the apartment. It looks like a hoarder's house, really. Like everything is just really makeshift and sh shoved together. There's like a closet that you can barely shut. There's so much stuff coming from it, coming out of it. Just an odd, odd feeling looking at those pictures. And throughout the trial, I'm looking at the back. He's bald with, let me see if I can get a picture of him. Hold on one second. Uh, hold on. So I guess this would be a good thing to show. So that's what we're talking about. That's actually like a thinner <laughs> view of him. So that's who we're talking about. That's Larry Ray. And um, so I'm looking at the his neck fat <laughs> through the entire trial every day. I, looking at this roll of net fat, they've dressed him in just like they dress Ghislaine Maxwell in sweaters and looking like trying to make them, him look like a English professor or something like that. And so I thought, what is the defense going to say? And the defense had a very interesting defense. I thought creative Allegra Glasshauser is the, the, came up and gave the opening statement for the defense and said, through the looking glass, you can only understand this case through the looking glass. These were all fantasists and they all believed these stories and they believed everything. These were storytellers, basically kind of like the 
madness of two, but like madness extended to a group of people. Like they all believed, they all believed this false story. And um, I thought it's creative. I don't know if it's going to work with a jury. The jury is very diverse, uh, pretty much divided equally between men and women, black and white, Hispanic. It, it, it's a very diverse jury. They seem interested. Who knows? The first witness was Santos Rosario, who was the boyfriend of Talia, Larry Ray's daughter. And he really, he got his sisters into this cult. He was absolutely devoted to Larry Ray. And we heard tapes of him being abused, threatened to hit with a hammer. He was also directed to have sex with Isabel Pollock, who is going to be up on trial for these same kinds of charges connected to this criminal enterprise in July. So that should be interesting to see how that turns out. And he was directed multiple times to confess, hand over his money, uh, and to and he's a very shy kid. You could see how he was dominated. He expressed that he had struggled with depression as a teenager and young adult. And he found Larry Ray in the beginning really helpful. He trusted him completely. And it just devolved to where Larry Ray orchestrated him being kicked out of college for psychological reasons, he instructed him to keep writing this psych psychology professor who was there when I was there. I knew immediately who it was when they brought it, brought up his first name. And he wrote him so many times, kept saying, keep writing, write, make sure you add this, make sure you tell him this. That way you can really get it off your chest and you'll feel really good about it. And here's the psychology professor getting these like constant weird emails from this troubled kid and that's how he was kicked out. <sighs> so this kid looks, he says he's working for a fabric company. He got to Sarah Lawrence on financial scholarship. He ended up turning over hundreds of thousands of dollars to Larry Ray. That the Friday ended at a half day with his direct. Does anyone have any questions um, about this trial or who's attending or any, anything at all. Um, it's, it's disturbing. There's not a lot of press there. And my thoughts on why I think there's not a lot of press there. A, there hasn't been a lot of press for this story besides New York magazine covering it fantastically is I think that there's a real issue with our college campuses and safety right now. And I think parents that are concerned are being looked at as overly involved and meddling by the teachers and the administration and some of the politicians who are talking about this issue of really radical college campus. Sarah Lawrence is very politically to the left. Um, so I will be continuing to report on this and um, I'm going to keep it short unless anybody has anything, but that's what's going on. And I'm going to keep reporting on it because hardly anyone else is. So, all right, have a good week guys. And I'll see you back next time.